Okay. Great. Hi. So we're having an interview with you today with President and Director of Central European University, John Shattuck. And this will be relatively informal in nature, so we'll just follow up your questions and some follow-ups and uh, see where that leads. Good. So uh, first off, uh, John Shattuck, thanks for sitting down with us. Um, can you just give us some introductory remarks about yourself? I know you have an extensive history of public service, civil liberties, and uh, human rights. Can you just tell us uh, how that shaped your worldview today? Well, I've been involved in uh, international work for many years, and uh, also civil rights work was of the sort of twin pillars of my career. Um, I was a civil rights lawyer in the U.S. for about a decade at the very beginning of my career, working on civil liberties and Civil Rights and the American Civil Liberties Union, working on the uh, what was known then as the Civil Rights Movement. It was sort of the tail end of that movement, bringing, to, bringing together people from all over the country who were trying to enact legislation to bring about equality of treatment to all Americans. Um, and uh, I was also involved at that point in some very important court cases that uh, were uh, brought to hold accountable the members, some members of the administration of President Richard Nixon, who had violated the civil liberties of, of uh, Americans. And uh, those court cases were very important in the context of the work that was done uh, by the House Judiciary Committee to develop articles of impeachment of President Nixon. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was an important part of my career. I then went to Harvard, and I was uh, vice president at Harvard and taught at the Harvard Law School on civil rights, uh, civil liberties. And at that point, uh, this was in the mid-1980s, uh, I started becoming uh, very active in uh, human rights and international work. I, I was elected to the board of directors of Amnesty International, and I uh, was the vice chair of Amnesty International, began to do a, a great deal of travel. And it was at that point that I had my first travel to Central Europe uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, I, I went to uh, Prague and the, uh, what was then Czechoslovakia in, in 1986, a very difficult time for the Czechs. I was doing a human rights report, uh, and I did that report uh, for Amnesty International, and the remarkable fact was that about four or five years later, four years later, I guess, uh, I opened up the newspaper in the New York Times when I was in the U.S. I saw the person who had been my principal contact as a dissident in uh, Prague uh, was the first ambassador, had just been named the first ambassador by another dissident, former president Václav Havel, uh, uh, to the United States. So that was sort of my personal involvement in the kind of changes that took place in this part of the world all during that period. Um, I continued to teach at, at Harvard and, and work on uh, international issues at Harvard Law School and then the Kennedy School of Government. And then I entered into government service. Uh, I was uh, asked by President Clinton to be the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And I was uh, very much involved in the uh, Balkan conflicts, uh, efforts to end those conflicts, uh, terrible human rights crimes and genocide that were being committed in, in Bosnia. Um, I was extremely uh, active uh, before there was any ceasefire on the ground in, in compiling evidence of the human rights abuses that were being committed um, and also involved in the date and peace process that ended the war in Bosnia. I was involved in many other international issues around the world during that period. Um, and then I became the U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic in 1998, which was kind of an amazing turn of events since that was where I began my career in Central Europe. Uh, and I got to know very well President Václav Havel, who at an earlier point, of course, was in prison when I first came to that, that part of the world and back to, to Prague. Um, so and then I spent uh, the last eight years uh, teaching human rights law and international relations at Tufts University and as uh, CEO of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation in Boston. So that's a kind of a nutshell that brings me to, to, to this job as president and director of CEU and all strains of my 
career really kind of point to mm -hmm. this seat that I'm in today, which well, is quite exciting. Clearly, you do have this this background in Central Europe, and uh, and uh, and I guess that leads us then into our next next natural mm -hmm. question, which is uh, see you here in, in Budapest, Hungary, and uh, there's some things that I think it's well known for its international character mm -hmm. uh, in terms of teaching. It has a very interdisciplinary approach to to teaching. There's a there's a focus on the intensive research here as well, and I'm sure you were aware of all these things before you came here. I'm just wondering of those, or what other types of things as well might have in particular attracted you to, to coming here? Well, I think CEU is a truly unique institution in the world. It is a global laboratory. Uh, we are made up of over 110 nations among the students, and about 30 to 40 nations among the faculty. There is no other university that has as great global diversity as, as CU. And at the same time, it's a young university, a dynamic one, and the opportunities to work across disciplines to bring together social sciences in a variety of different ways, in humanities, law, business management, um, and public policy in the way that I think we can do at CU happening now, which I hope to uh, make, uh, bring to even greater heights, uh, is, a, is a remarkable opportunity, which no, very few other universities have. My experience teaching and, and as a vice president at Harvard University, a much bigger university, an older university, very difficult to turn the ship of state when you're running a big, big ship like Harvard. When you're at CEU, I think we can be more nimble have an opportunity, and I think I sense this among the, the faculty and students, that there's a hunger to work across disciplines and to, to make this university greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and so that's really what attracted me here, okay. to say nothing of the, the mission, the Open Society mission, which is really the, at the heart of, of what CU is all about. Sure. Uh, well, you mentioned the word opportunity there, and that's not, and there's one other aspect that I think is quite interesting about CEU, and that is that it's has one foot in the U.S. and one foot in mm -hmm. Europe, and uh, which can at times be quite challenging to negotiate these, these two identities. Um, however, I think there are also a lot of opportunities that that, that uh, fact engenders as well, so perhaps you can talk yeah. about some of those opportunities. Well, CEU is really a sort of three-legged stool. Uh, we have the American leg, we are registered in New York State, the Board of Regents, and very much an American university. We are a Hungarian university. Um, uh, we have, have been recognized by the Hungarian parliament and just recently in an amendment to the Hungarian law, uh, which uh, gives special recognition to universities of an international character like CEU. And then finally, the third leg is the European Union, which provides uh, support for scholarships, for students who come from outside of the European Union area, and of course many of our students are in that category, and uh, also research funding. So uh, that makes us, again, a truly unique, uh, there's no other university that's a Hungarian, American, European university. Uh, it certainly creates legal challenges in terms of making sure that all the regulatory aspects of all three of those uh, jurisdictions are met. But I think CU does very well by that, and, uh, and it creates enormous opportunities uh, because I think our our identity and, and character as a university is truly unique in a way that no national university, a university based in, a, in one nation, no matter how international it may be among its students, can ever be quite what it is that CU can be with these three legs, uh, which create a very sturdy, sturdy seat the CEU uh, academic work to take place. Yes, yeah, and uh, that, that work is it's taking place in, in a particular environment, which is, of course, as we've already spoken about, quite mm -hmm. international in character. Um, you know, the history of CEU, first, of course, as we know, they were recruiting mainly from Central Europe and Eastern Europe mm -hmm. in, this, in this area. Uh, in recent years, though, the recruitment base is, is considerably expanded. Now yeah. we're recruiting from more than uh, 100 countries, or student mm -hmm. bodies, you know, almost that many. 
And I think that, uh, well, I'd like to Actually, the student body is now 110 now countries. Now we've actually yeah. crossed over that 100 yes. mark, so that's yeah. what we're skirting right. for a while. We're yeah. nowhere past that. Um, so you, you hinted at some of this before, but I'm wondering what particular uh, advantages or things we can take advantage of based upon this fact that we have over half the world's countries yeah. represented. Yeah. Well, I think it gives every subject that's studied at CBU a, a, a kind of new dimension that you don't get anywhere else. If you sit in a CBU classroom, as I have, and uh, you find that uh, often no two students are going to come from the same country, they're each bringing a different national perspective. If they're studying something like medieval history, for example, um, their curiosity about the Middle Ages in Central Europe uh, can reflect a Chinese or an Indian or a, or a Colombian or a Venezuelan point of view, uh, every bit as much as the point of view of, of people from this region. Uh, it also gives an impetus to our faculty, sticking with the, with the medieval studies example, which one tends to think of as the study of the Middle Ages in Europe. Our medieval studies department is now reaching far to the east, and we're beginning to look at what was going on contemporarily in China and India, uh, and in, in, the, in the entire Arab world uh, and the Islamic world uh, during that same period. That's a unique approach toward medieval studies. Um, you look at another subject that's more contemporary, uh, the study of, of political science, and the the issues of governance and how uh, governance works in different settings. And again, you have uh, the whole global culture to draw from and the different kinds of governance structures that exist in various different countries. And a common set of themes across all of those cultures, which is how, how do we transform our society? How do we, how do we uh, enter into a transition from an old, uh, completely nation-state approach toward uh, governance mm -hmm. to a more uh, transnational and international approach. How do we deal with the issues of communications and media, um, which are changing so rapidly around us as all the new means of communication get developed and the old media begin to disappear? All nations and cultures have to deal with that. But here at CEU, we can actually reflect uh, from every country's perspective what these different issues are. So that's what brings the rich diversity of this university into sharp focus when it comes to working on our, on our academic program. So in essence, we've been able not only to have students and faculty with additional perspectives, but we've been able to expand our own academic focus as a result of this. Right. This yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think you mentioned you just had a chance to meet some students last week and mm -hmm. before that as well. And, uh, well, and over the weekend too, we all went running right, together. We were all running out of the run, so right. in many different, uh, many different areas. And uh, well, in short, I mean, how would you yeah. describe the CU students you met so far, and what are your impressions of it to, to this point? CU students are all the ones that I've met are adventuresome. I mean, they are they are risk taking. They're out there uh, doing something that, uh, after all, is a rather brave thing to do. They're they're coming to a truly international setting. They're speaking English, not their own native tongue. Um, they've, they've decided that this is the kind of ferment that's interesting to them. Uh, but they're also wonderful, normal people at the same time. They're, you know, they're all smart. These are very good students. We have a, a highly selective uh, student body, and of course, we, we provide assistance, scholarship assistance to the very best students uh, and, and, it, and choose our students on the basis of merit and then make sure that if they need assistance they get it. Uh, so we don't simply educate the elites who, who from, from old elites, but rather from people who the people who are who are uh, who have the who have the opportunity to get ahead, get ahead even if their parents may never have gone to college. Uh, so these are, they're, these are very enterprising people, that's CU students, and I think the record of where they go afterwards, the alumni that we have, shows that many of them enter into uh, government, uh, international, uh, transnational, uh, often working in organizations like the UN, uh, but they also go into academia, and they 
go back and teach in their own countries and become the kind of mainstays of their, or they go into the, into the European Parliament. We have several members of uh, the graduate alumni who uh, were in the uh, European Parliament or in their own parliaments. Uh, so they're, you know, these, these are people who are going to be leaders, a new generation of leaders in, in a transnational world. Right. And uh, with respect to those students graduating, becoming alumni, and then going back to either their own countries or international organizations, a lot of them likely will be quite active in, in trying to shape policy and these mm -hmm. kind of things, which would lead into to what I'd like to ask next. Next, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we have society institute, mm -hmm. of course, and see you have a long-standing relationship with the Society right. Institute. And their mission is is, uh, is to try to build a vibrant and tolerant mm -hmm. democracies. Uh, I'm wondering that CU, obviously, on the institute like that, the university, what is CU's role, if any, mm -hmm. in, in, in being active in trying to shape policy? Well, CU is going to have a very close relationship, while I'm president and rector, with OSI and with other uh, global civil society organizations. And we're going to do this through a new entity that we're creating. We're creating a, a school of public policy at CU. And our School of Public Policy, like everything else at CEU, will be quite different from what goes on in many other schools of public policy around the world. You often think of public policy as it's taught in standard universities as a subject that involves figuring out how governments are going to develop good policy and then implement it. What we're going to study is how people, civil society elements, people from all over the world who are having an impact on are organizing to uh, try to influence the development of uh, policy, whether it's in the field of global warming, or the subject of poverty eradication, or issues of the delivery of health care, uh, or human rights, uh, or uh, international security. These are all subjects that are of intense interest to a global civil society. And CEU, through its School of Public Policy, working closely with OSI and other organizations. He's going to study all of that. Um, we're not an advocacy organization. We are an academic institution. And that's what we, we, we will remain. Uh, and we will do our best work by building the, um, the framework within which you can understand how public policy is developed. And you can understand even more fundamental issues like how the social networks are developed through sociology or, or the, the history of any particular area through the history department. Um, and we'll get those departments working together, particularly through the School of Public Policy. But that's, uh, that's how CEU will relate to, to the world of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And it will do so through the organizations that we'll study and work closely with, like OSI. Okay. All right. um, you're mentioning actually listing some of these, these areas of research and, and mm -hmm. public policy, and uh, actually related to that, I was wondering what, uh, what, are, what are some up and coming areas of research topics, areas that you think that, that, that merit additional focus mm -hmm. or more focus in the future? Yeah. The well, I think I mentioned a few of them just now. We have yeah. very, we're very strong in the environmental science and policy area. We have several uh, research institutes in that, in that area, and I think we're going to be deepening our our work on, envir on the environment, and, and particularly in the, in the topic of, you know, which is so much on people's minds, global warming, but, uh, but also in, the, in areas involving energy and energy policy and the, uh, and the impact of, of various aspects of, of human interaction with the environment on the ultimate uh, fate of the environment. Um, I think issues of uh, health care uh, our global concern is certainly a great concern right now in the United States, which, which is wrestling with this. Um, I think CEU will, will probably develop, again, working with OSI, which has a very strong uh, interest in, in public health, uh, will be, we'll be investigating this area and uh, doing a variety of different kinds of research, particularly on questions of uh, how to encourage Healthcare professionals, doctors, and others who are 
educated in one place to make sure that they return to their countries if they come from countries that have a great need for medical uh, professionals so that they don't simply become part of the brain drain. Uh, that's an area that I think CU can have an impact on. Um, you know, I think the questions of human rights will continue to be a very central focus of, of what CU does, but, but human rights in the broadest sense of that word, human security, uh, how do we provide uh, security for the integrity of individuals, protecting individuals from uh, the kind of mistreatment that they often receive at the hands of governments and others? Um, how can we understand the, the underlying conditions which lead to major human rights abuses? Why does genocide occur? Uh, what, are the, what are the circumstances under which uh, leaders in, in countries that are uh, falling apart in failed states are going to uh, sometimes stimulate uh, ethnic conflict which can even lead to genocide. How do we understand all that better? These are the kinds of things that I think CU, um, and I've just mentioned three or four sure. examples sure. that CU sure. will be doing uh, in its School of Public Policy and, and in many of its departments. Mm -hmm. and, uh Finally, I would say, so in the midst of these challenges that the world faces, right. which CU, of course, wants to, wants to uh, conduct its own research on, um, what do you think actually, what are challenges that CU itself must, must face in the coming five years? Mm -hmm. so what, what, what are the main challenges we have as an institution here? Well, I think we have several. Um, we certainly have a physical space challenge, and that is we need to, we need to grow. We need to grow. We are going to grow, certainly, if we develop a new school of pol public policy. We Grow. We also have a business school that, uh, that needs to be integrated more into the university. So, physical space uh, is is a, a challenge, and I think it's one that we will meet. And I'm determined to meet. We're, we're working on it right now, as a matter of fact. Um, I think integrating the various parts of the university is another challenge. Um, as we've grown, we've become more successful and, and more. Uh, excellent in many fields. Uh, we've got to make sure that the university coheres, that it is a community of scholars, of uh, people who will interact with each other and, and bring the expertise that they have in one discipline or another to, uh, to bear on work that maybe is going on at the whole university. I mentioned earlier the business school. The business school needs to be brought back into this central part of the university and be seen as I think it should be, as a, as a major contributor to the uh, open society principles of CEU as we go forward. And I think there's some administrative challenges with the business school as well as integration challenges. The development of a new school of public policy and working that uh, and developing a close relationship between the existing departments and the school of public policy while maintaining the, uh, the strength and growth of each of the departments at the same time that the, that the School of Public Policy develops. Um, I think we, we also will, will want to uh, you know, work very much as we become a global institution, and we are very much becoming that with all these uh, over 100 countries represented among the students, uh, still to find a good balance between CEU as a global institution and CEU as an institution that's rooted in this region. Central Europe. It got its start here, and it, it has some of its most central values coming out of here. And I think Budapest uh, is a very fine home for CEU because Budapest is really a crossroads in the world. And I think it's a, it's it's good that CEU is in a a city that is not specifically associated with any one very large country. Uh, we're not in Western Europe. We're not in the United States. We're, we're in Central Europe. We're in a, in a proud and, and storied uh, uh, city, which, which I think, as I said, is a crossroads. Historically, it's been a crossroads, and, and today, in many ways, it can be a crossroads. So it's a good symbol of CEU as a university that's rooted in this region, but has grown into a global institution. And so we need to work on that relationship. So those are the kinds of things that we're facing in the, in the period ahead.
It sounds like yeah. uh, we have uh, a lot of good stuff to do. A few, a few things yeah. upcoming to do, but uh, I wish you all the best of luck with that, of course. Uh, President Rector, John Chat, thanks a lot for the interview today, and good luck in the future. Thank you. Okay. Great.